morning everyone. I'll be presenting on behalf of Medicine 4. Um, so coming to the history, a 46-year-old bookbinder from Bangalore presented with complaints of fever and myalgia for 20 days and burning ulceration and bilateral pitting pediledema for the past 10 days. So he was apparently well when he developed high-grade intermittent fever with chills, one spike every one to two days, which was relieved initially by NSAIDs. He also had severe myalgia, body ache in the limbs, but he continued to go to work and fever was initially con controlled with over-the-counter medication. He had worsening fever, body ache, with swelling of bilateral lower limbs and facial puffiness. He also had burning sensation while passing urine and shortness of breath. There was no hematuria, urgency or frequency, no flag pain or shorty urine. He didn't have any cough with sputum, no chest pain, no syncope or palpitations, no abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, no stools or jaundice, no bleeding manifestation, no history of recent travel outside the district, no history of eating any outside food, no history of any preceding URI symptoms, and no similar illness in any uh, close contacts. No other complaints. He was also vaccinated for uh, COVID. No other vaccination. Past history, he had no known comorbidities. He works as a bookbinder. He actually sits cross-legged on the floor for long periods of time. He had bilateral calluses and skin peeling. He also uh, complains of intermittent fetal edema and rolling pain for the past six months, for which he has been taking NSAIDs and steroids frequently from a local pharmacy. Personal history, he used to consume alcohol in the past between 20 and 25 years of age, but he's been abstinent for almost 20 years and he does not smoke or chew pan. Treatment history, he was initially admitted for the same elsewhere. First, he took over the counter medication, then admitted elsewhere. He received IV doxycycline for three days and then he continued to worsen and then presented to us. So, on examination, he was conscious, oriented, cooperative. He was tachypneic, breathing at rate of about 38 to 40. Um, uh, all peripheral pulses were palpable. He was tachycardic uh, with a BP of 100 by 70, requiring 5 mics of NORAD to maintain the blood pressure. Pressure rate was initially 40, which came down to 20, using accessory muscles. He was afebrile at time of presentation and saturation was 100%. He also had some uh, blanching erythematous rash over bilateral upper limbs and bilateral pedal edema extending up to the ankles. Uh, the uh, respiratory, otherwise, uh, systemic examination, respiratory had bilateral diffuse crepitations in all lung regions and uh, per abdomen showed diffuse abdominal tenderness, but the abdomen was soft and there was slightly more tenderness in the right upper quadrant. The uh, uh, central nervous examination was unremarkable. So, coming to uh, the syndrome, uh, syndrome, we had a patient, 44, 5 year old gentleman with fever with dysuria, worsening breathlessness, fetal edema, and an erythematous rash over bilateral upper limbs with no known comorbidities. So, initial differential diagnosis we considered in view of the dysuria with fever and uh, worsening breathlessness is acute pyelonephritis with systemic sepsis and an ERDS or any of the acute undifferentiated febrile illness because the history actually preceded the onset of dysuria. So, dengue, scrub, malaria, leptospirosis or in view of the rash, we also considered spotted fever. So, because of the shock, he was actually admitted in ICU and started. Uh, so, his investigations at that time, he had an outside report which actually showed elevated blood counts, total counts. But uh, over here, his total counts are 6,000 with 82% newness on the smear. Platelet counts of 44,000. He had an acute kidney injury, a uh, creat of 3.99, which is elevated compared to the outside report. LFT showed uh, uh, direct hyperbilirubinemia with uh, alkaline phosphatase elevation. There was no transaminase elevation. And uh, urine analysis showed 204 WBCs with nitrate negative and bacteria 3 plus, leukocytes 3 plus. So, um, because of this, we also imaged to rule out obstructive uropathy and uh, complicated uh, urinary tract infection. We found a 6 millimeter obstructive VUJ calculus, uh, which urology opinion was sort managed conservatively. Incidentally, HPOC was 6.8. He was detected to be a newly diagnosed diabetic. The other workup, uh, BB waste, dengue, scrub, lepto, all which were sent on the first day was negative. Urine culture was negative, but blood culture grew E. coli, which was tiprazolin, tazobactam resistant, and neuropenum susceptible. So, our diagnosis was a complicated urinary tract infection. We started antibiotics, and uh, the BOJ was, urology consultation was obtained. It was managed conservatively. He improved and he was shifted out of ICU on day five. So, on day six, he was actually clinically improving. He didn't know oxygen requirements uh, had come down. And uh, septic dose of steroids was stopped and neuropenum was continued in view of positive blood culture. One day later, he developed new onset high-grade fever with chills, elevated count, CRP, and an asymmetrical inflammatory polyarthritis involving both large and small joints. So, at this time, the differentials we considered were either a persistent E. coli bacteremia with a, uh, due to poor source control, uh, either a renal abscess, 
or a hospital acquired infection because of being in the ICU, either line related sepsis or a the lower respiratory tract infection. Drug fever was concerned because some of the febrile episodes did not have an associated tachycardia. And the last was an adesolium crisis in the view of in view of the fact that he previously had uh, uh, steroid intake with reactive arthritis as an explanation for all the uh, joint involvement. So we went ahead and evaluated for this. His repeat blood cultures were negative. He didn't have any new focus clinically of infection. CT thorax abdomen did not show any abscesses. Transthoracic echo didn't show any vegetations. And his differential counts are actually coming down. So um, then uh, we considered adrenal insufficiency and we sent a random cortisol, which was sent at 10 a.m. And it showed a serum cortisol of 2.1. This is two days after stopping the steroids. So we diagnosed Addisonian crisis. He was started on hydrocortisone 50 mg Q6 uh, With this, actually, he significantly improved and uh, he completed his antibiotics and was discharged. So we were thinking this either might have been provoked by critical illness adrenal insufficiency or a secondary adrenal insufficiency due to abrupt cessation of ex exogenous corticosteroid or whether he had uh, uh, fulminant septicemia with Waters prediction syndrome, but he didn't appear so clinically sick. So uh, I'd just like to highlight some points about critical illness steroid insufficiency, which is a new name of this, and the pathogenesis and some approach to management. So as we all know, the HPA axis, actually the earliest animal models, they found that adrenalectomy causes profound shock and death in all these animal models. Later, they found that uh, Addison's disease had very poor uh, outcomes before corticosteroids were discovered and pharmacotherapy was initiated. And uh, they went on to discover stress causes release of CRH uh, from the hypothalamic uh, paraventricular nuclei, then causes pituitary to secrete ACTH, and then adrenal cortex synthesis and secrete cortisol. This is what exerts a cardiovascular, metabolic, and immune regulatory responses to allow survival. And actually, uh, noradrenaline and adrenaline require cortisol to actually exert their effect on the vasculature. And of course, this whole thing is under feedback inhibition. So, um, the earliest hypothesis of this uh, critical illness induced, uh, critical illness related adrenal insufficiency was the study done in 2000. They actually found that. Uh, Everybody knew that there was a cortisol insufficiency in these patients. They were wondering whether it will be respon responsive to a short uh, ACTH stimulation test. So they actually injected ACTH in these people and they divided them into two groups. Those who responded, that is there was a cortisol response and those who did not. So because they found that mortality was worse in the group that did not respond, they hypothesized that possibly the adrenal cortex was maximally activated and could not keep up with the uh, demand. So therefore these people were going to profound shock. So they Clear that supraphysiological doses, high, uh, high dose hydrocortisone was required to overcome this because adrenal was insufficient. And they proved this hypothesis by their first RCT that they did, which was around 2004 2005. The only problem was this was confounded by atomidate, which is known to suppress adrenal uh, secretion. In 2008, a large RCT, corticus RCT, was done, which did not confirm the, any of the findings. And subsequently, all RCTs contradicted the findings. Some actually proved it, some disproved it. They had no relation to whether they responded to ACTH or not. So this was the conundrum initially. And then uh, this study, which was actually published in 2013 in NEGM, actually published an alternative hypothesis as to why all this happens. So whether there's actually a reduced cortisol metabolism and not a reduced secretion of cortisol, which is causing this whole thing. So how they actually found it is um, they injected radio-labeled tracer uh, cortisol into the patient and then track what all happens to it, whether the degradation is happening, what's happening to the ACTH. They continuously monitored in this in both the healthy cohort as well as uh, critically ill patients. What they found is they su suppressed expression and activity of the cortisol metabolizing enzymes, that is uh, AR reductase in the liver and 11 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase in the kidney. That was one. The next was there was a rapid decline in circuiting circulating levels of the corticosteroid carrier protein and transcortin and reduce binding affinity to these proteins also in severe sepsis uh, in response to inflammation and neutrophil activation. The third was that uh, the plasma ACTH concentration in these people were actually lower than those of matched healthy subjects. So uh, what they postulated was that it's actually uh, this lower protein binding and uh, decreased metabolism contributes to increased cortisol availability to the target tissues and rather than a central HPO excess suppression as was originally thought to be the cause. So it's decreased metabolism and not that. So they 
went in with the paradigm shift from relative adrenal insufficiency to actually it's a critical illness related corticosteroid insufficiency. They uh, went on to actually find that these studies don't contradict those findings. If the plasma proteins where cortisol is bound actually reduces, the volume of distribution of cortisol increases dramatically. It goes into all the target tissues also. So when you measure the serum cortisol concentration, it's actually much lower than you would expect. Uh, and uh, when they went on to see in the sickest of patients, which is where these uh, proteins are least uh, produced, the binding is least, obviously the cortisol response is also least in all these patients because you're measuring a serum cortisol. So this is how they explain both the original study and the later findings of all the RCTs could be explained based on this. So uh, this is the new uh, un related corticosteroid insufficiency. So to summarize what I've said so far, a prolonged critical illness, which is several weeks, uh, hypocortisolemia, high circulating bile acids, and other endogenous glucocorticoid receptor ligands actually extra, uh, exert a prolonged defect on the HP axis and cause it to be suppressed. So as the patient recovers and comes, because of the prolonged defect, the adrenals don't recover fast enough to produce cortisol. Therefore, they have a residual corticosteroid insufficiency. Then other drugs uh, like we saw already, atomidate, opioids, hazard derivatives, all these things also contribute further. And uh, of course, we have the symptoms and signs of corticosteroid insufficiency. So uh, this is just one slide on some new updates on that. Uh, they're also finding that there is an upregulation of the glucocorticoid uh, positive receptor alpha and downregulation of the beta receptors, which have negative function for glucocorticoids in the peripheral tissue. Originally, they thought that this is also an immune dysregulation, but now they're saying this might be actually favorable to ensure that the activity of cortisol is more in the tissue and it's uh, in the tissues of action and less activity on neutrophils and the peripheral blood uh, inflammatory response to infection. So uh, overall summarizing, coming back to how all this applies to management. So you have to clearly delineate the patient into three different groups. Either they have pre-existing intrinsic HP axis suppression, the most common cause of which is exogenous steroid, abrupt cessation of that, which will trigger an crisis, which we then go on to supplement cortisol. This is what we call the stress uh, stress steroid. The other is acute septic shock. So this was actually the group that they studied. They thought acute septic shock is due to a relative uh, insufficiency. But now they're saying even septic shock doesn't require immediately. You wait. If it's the refractory septic shock, then you may think that giving some corticosteroids may be of some benefit. But not all septic shock you need to initi immediately initiate hydrocortisone uh, for that. And the third is a prolonged critically ill patient requiring mechanical ventilation. As you wean them off and the steroids are stopped, because of this prolonged effect of glucocorticoid suppression of all the HPO axis, they may have an uh, adult insufficiency which may last some time. They require only very small dose steroids, which is within the physiological range. They don't require the stress dose steroid per se for replacement. So we have to clearly delineate the patients to these three. So uh, originally our theory was that either it's a secondary adrenal insufficiency because of cessation or it's a critical illness uh, adrenal insufficiency. But in him, both the duration, because it was just four or five days in ICU that he had, and this made that less likely. So actually we could have just given him uh, the stress dose. I mean, eventually we gave him only the stress dose. But the learning point is, if it was critical illness adrenal insufficiency, we need not give a full stress dose. We can just give the physiological replacement dose and that should be enough for him. So his symptoms resolved after initiation of steroids. He was uh, started on maintenance prednisolone and spanned for OPD follow-up. So this is the new understanding that it's not a relative adrenal insufficiency, but it's actually a prolonged suppression. And you may not require testosterone steroids in patients with no previous HPA access suppression. You may just give maintenance steroids if they come out of it. But in our patient, because he had previous HPA access suppression, he needed steroids. What happened uh, when he had those symptoms? Um, what he happened? Hydrocortisone. So his BP picked up his entire... His... What symptoms he developed? So he came originally in shock. So that is why he was started on uh, stress protocol steroids. I mean, uh, 50 mg Q6H. For shock, he was started on along with meropenem and everything in the ICU. As he improved, that steroid was stopped. And he came out to the ward, he was fine for two days. Then he again abruptly worsened. And worsen, what worsen means he developed new onset fever, arthralgia, as well as shock. Now, the problem was we thought everything was related. We thought it's a new sepsis that is developed from ICU. But the arthralgia was actually a reactive arthralgia which settled by itself. The fever also came down. And actually, there are reports which says even in Addison's crisis, fever also can 
be one of the manifestations. So everything was actually explained by that. And uh, cortisol levels we did that. Time. Cortisol only one random cortisol we had because he was getting that was two point one uh, at ten a.m. We did it. Uh, this is two days. Two days after this one. It's very borderline. Just yeah. We are yeah. yeah. Impossible. Yeah. The the it's a lot very vague. This thing. The only thing is after that he completely improved and everything settled. If it was sepsis, it might have worsened. Was on steroids before also for the so, arthritis. He was intermittently taking. What he actually had was a bursitis because he sat cross leg for long periods of time. He developed bursitis of the this thing, and he kept going and taking steroids and NSAIDs for that. And then, you know, right? Clinical. He didn't look cushion, so he didn't have a cushion. So. How long was he staying in ICU? Four days. Sir. It's not prolonged. It was not prolonged. But there are case reports which say that within five to seven days also they have seen it. In a patient who has never been exposed to it. More consistent with somebody who had long exogenous steroids. Steroid. Yes, sir. Had, uh, experiences of that was the final diagnosis. This said, uh, and actually this article mentions in somebody with HVOS access suppression, we cannot diagnose critical illness related uh, adrenal insufficiency. It's not supposed to be diagnosed at all. You have to attribute it to the HP access suppression. Mm -hmm. And there are reports which say that even an Addison's crisis fever can happen. We were not sure. By the time we gave the steroid and everything, and the neuropenem was tapered and stopped, he recovered completely. And we tapered the steroid also down to maintenance. So uh, his counts were coming down. There was no clinical focus of sepsis anywhere. Imaging, nothing we could find uh, for the focus. We'll move on to the next one. I think the learning here was that this patient came very sick in septic shock. He has a bio crisis with blood culture, three blood cultures, E. coli, E. coli. It was on antibiotics, it was in the ICU. He came out. He was not mechanically aware. And after he came to the ward, within 24 hours, he had a spike of fever, severe arthritis, and he became hypothesis. So immediately the doctor said he has picked up an osteoporosis and he was born in the septic shock. So we changed his antibiotic after going from the first to cover other kinds of pathogens. So the, the, the diagnostic binary, that is a, this is a big problem. So, so we have closed our minds to all of the possibilities. And you know, hypotensive but not at all. We are fully conscious, the sexualities were well produced, we were drinking good amount of urine, the normal bowel sounds, this lactate was normal, the bicarb was normal. So it's not a shock. Then, uh, asking the history, he gets two to three intermuscular injections every month and has it over the counter for pain. So, never close your mind to so shock. So, think of all the parts of the problem. I'm saying this is a big shock. The fever is such a shock. He said this high level is on the infection, low calcium on infection. So, you're, you're lacking yourself in the corner of the patient, you're not improving.